purpose of Free Thought Forum is to be vigilant to the encroachment of religion into government and to educate the general public as to what a free thinker is. My thoughts give me power. No scholar can map them. No hunter can trap them. No person. Hi, welcome to Free Thought Forum. I'm your host today, Jeff Levan. My guest today is Jesse Torres. And we're going to be discussing a, a writer who uh, is certainly significant in atheist thought, philosophy in general, and uh, very influential in economic thought also. Uh, the woman we're going to be discussing is Ayn Rand. The name uh, many people mispronounce as Ayn Rand. It's, it's not pronounced Ayn, it's pronounced Ayn, and rhymes with mine. It's an easy way to remember it. Uh, Ayn Rand is important for a great many reasons. Uh, she uh, she's important because she brought back uh, Aristotelian uh, ideals uh, ideas uh, based on reason she was a, she was very much in a, a proponent of reason uh, a little bit about her background is necessary so I thought I would fill you in with a little bio, short biographical sketch about who Ayn Rand was before we select some of her readings and and speak about those her name uh, was Alyssa Rosenbaum uh, she was born in 1905, uh, February 2nd, in Russia. She was born in St. Petersburg. Uh, when she was a young child, her father uh, had a good business. He was a chemist, had a good business. Uh, however, his shop was taken over when they became uh, nationalized due to the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, she saw firsthand the effects of communism. Uh, this influenced her greatly. Um, she graduated with a major in history from the University of Leningrad and uh, after graduation she decided she saw the changes that was happening to her, her country and she saw what was she kept hoping that she would be able to stay but she saw more and more that she need, she had to go she could not stay in, in a communist uh, system so in 1926 at the age of 21 she emigrated to America on a visitor's visa uh, knowing fully well that she would never come back uh, she never, matter of fact, it was the last time she would see most of the members of her family. But she made her way to the United States and to become a writer, and along the way changed her name to Ayn Rand from Alyssa Rosenbaum. The name Ayn she took from a Finnish writer who she admired his work, and the name Rand came from the Remington Rand typewriter that she used. Uh, she proceeded from, uh, as soon as she got uh, to the United States, she worked her way across to uh, to Hollywood and wound up working as a scriptwriter for Cecil B. DeMille, Cecil B. DeMille. Interestingly enough, uh, her first uh, part in a picture, a bit part, uh, actually it was a walk-on, was in King of Kings, which was a interesting uh, thing, her being an atheist, uh, to her first big chance, her first money-making opportunity to use her writing skills was in King of Kings. So. Um, from then on, she, she went on to her successes that we're going to discuss about the books that she wrote. But the, the influence of that eyewitness, eyewitnessing the Russian Revolution and the bloodshed firsthand was to stick with her forever. I wanted to uh, read just briefly a selection. Uh, this is out of Barbara Brandon's book, The Passion of Ayn Rand. It's available at the San Antonio Public Library. I wanted to read a short uh, section where she describes some of those first-hand things that she saw. Uh, she says, On an afternoon that she remembered vividly all of her life, Alice stood in her father's chemist's shop, watching in bewilderment as Franz Rosenbaum gathered together the few personal possessions he kept in the shop and hurried to hide them in the apartment. As he was returning, armed soldiers burst into the shop and stamped a red seal on the door. The shop was nationalized in the name of the people. Anna Rosenbaum rushed Alice back to the apartment, but not before she had seen the look on her father's face. I felt the way he looked. His look was one of helpless, murderous frustration and indignation. He could do absolutely nothing. It was a horrible, silent spectacle of brutality and injustice. I thought, that's the principle of communism. She said, uh, even at that age, she's talking about the age of about nine, nine to twelve. Even at that age, I could see what was wrong with communism. It meant living for the state. I realized they were saying that the illiterate and the poor had to be rulers of the earth because they were illiterate and poor. She was startled by the fact that while everyone complained bitterly about the physical hardships caused by the communists, no one seemed equally indignant about their ideology. 
when she first heard the communist slogan shrilled in the Bolsheviks every speech and article and plastered on walls throughout the city, that man must live for the state, she knew that this was the horror of the root of all the other horrors taking place around her. This was the source of the bloodshed, the confiscations, the arrests in the night, the fear gripping the city she loved. It, she heard it in the statement that the purpose of her life was not her own to choose, that her life and her work must be given in selfless servitude to others. She saw the life of the men of intelligence, of ambition, of independence, the life of men whose proud worshippers she had chosen to be, claimed as the property of the mob. It, quote, it was the demand for the sacrifice of the best among men and for the enshrinement of the commonplace that I saw as the unspeakable evil of communism. End quote. Very uh, powerful. She, she, know, she knew what she spoke of, having been a, a first-hand witness. A good summary of the spirit that moved her she developed into a, philosophy. She developed a philosophy called objectivism. Uh, Jesse, would you right. speak a little bit about objectivism and what that is? Well, first, uh, I wanted to say <clears throat> that she, uh, she became a philosopher, and uh, she defines philosophy in the New Left. Philosophy is the science that studies the fundamental aspects of the nature of existence. The task of philosophy is to provide man with a comprehensive view of life. This view serves as a base, a frame of reference for all his actions, mental or physical, psychological or existential. This view tells him the nature of the universe with which he has to deal, metaphysics, the means by which he is to deal with it, i.e. the means of acquiring knowledge, epistemology, the standards by which he is to choose his goals and values in regard to his own life and character, ethics, and in regard to society, politics. The means of con concretizing this view gives him the aesthetics. And in The Voice of Reason, she gives a brief summary of her philosophy of objectivism. One, metaphysics, reality exists as an objective absolute. Facts are facts, independent of man's feelings, wishes, hopes, or fears. Two, epistemology, reason, the faculty which identifies and integrates the material pr provided by man's senses, is man's only means of perceiving reality, his only source of knowledge, and his only guide to action, and his basic means of survival. Three, ethics. Man, every man, is an end in himself, not the means to the ends of others. He must exist for his own sake, neither sacrificing himself to others nor sacrificing others to himself. The pursuit of his own rational self-interest and of his own happiness is the highest moral purpose of his life. And then finally, four, you have her politics or economics. The ideal political economic system is laissez-faire capitalism. It is a system where men deal with one another not as victims and executioners, nor as masters and slaves, but as traitors by a free voluntary exchange of mutual, to mutual benefit. It is a system where no man may obtain any values from others by resorting to physical force, and no man may initiate the use of physical force against others. The government acts only as a policeman that protects man's rights. It uses physical force only in retaliation and only against those who initiate its force such as criminals or foreign invaders. In a system of full capitalism, there should be, but historically has not yet been, a complete separation of state and economics in the same way and for the same reasons as the separation of state and church. So she uh, referred to herself as a radical for capitalism, yes. very much uh, um, opposed to collectivism, very much opposed to the welfare state. Uh, she even uh, testified before the House Un-American Activities Committee uh, when Joseph McCarthy was having his uh, his roundup uh, during the during the 40s. Mm -hmm. uh, the one thing that strikes me about Ayn Rand and all of her works is she before she got into explicitly explaining her philosophy she wrote several novels in which the protagonist, the hero, is the people who, as she said, not real people who exist, but heroes as she would like them to be. People mm -hmm. she would like them to be. She gave these people these qualities. Uh, they're almost like Greek mythology in a way. Uh, the, 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 the strength and the integrity of, of her characters. 
and equally the sliminess of those who are opposed, <laughs> which is not to say that she wrote simplistic novels, not at all. She wrote very, very interesting novels. Uh, in fact, I might go through a couple of them. Uh, the one that you're probably most famous with is the one that you see on high school and college campuses, and, and a lot of people start off and never, never get the chance to finish, which is uh, Atlas Shrugged. And uh, this is one that uh, is quite a long book. She, uh, it has not been made into a movie yet, although most of her uh, books that she wrote, she did make screenplays for. She thought it was a very effective way of communicating uh, was through the, the voice and, and the video media, which is one of the reasons why we do things here on cable, too. It's an effective medium of reaching people. Yeah, she, in, in that book, uh, there's a section called Galt's Speech. John Galt's Speech. Right. The, the hero is, uh, is John Galt, who is a man who refuses to live off second-handers. Well, he refuses to allow second-handers to live off of him. Right. Uh, he wants to own very much professing the capitalist ideals. Uh, she, she has another book which does the same, essentially has the same ideas expressed a little differently, and that's called The Fountainhead. The Fountainhead is, uh, has been made into a movie with uh, Patricia Neal and Gary Cooper in 1949, and it's still available uh, at your local video outlets. Yeah, I shouldn't just rented it this week. <laughs> yeah, shouldn't have any problem finding it. Uh, it's, it's available. It wasn't a big commercial success, but she did make enough money to allow her to uh, to go into philosophy, you know, which is a field that normally one probably wouldn't expect to make too much money at. Uh, her all of her all of her themes re revolve around uh, her philosophy revolves around the idea of enlightened self. Uh, Self, uh, what would you call self it? Self-interest. Self-interest. Enlightened self-interest, and also uh, grounded very strictly in reality. Uh, there is no cause for, there's no room there for whim. Simply because right. you want it to be true does not make it true. It very much hinges on the law of identity. A is A, and that's it. <laughs> there, A cannot be B at the same time. Um, I selected some other things that would help to illustrate her position and how she feels. I want to go ahead and read another. The reason why, one of the reasons why I'm reading so much from her own work instead of uh, telling you what she thinks is because she was very protective when she was alive. She died in 1982. Very protective when she was alive of, of her words. Uh, those were her ideas. And uh, to this day, the, the objectivists who follow in her footsteps are also very protective of their words to make sure they're represented correctly. So I, I prefer, and Jesse and I, I think, chose the right way to uh, go ahead and let the words speak for themselves. And hopefully, if you're interested, you'll look up some of these books and, um, and get a better idea of where she was going to. One of the things which concerns me and how I got involved with, inter interested in Ayn Rand is the fact that she's an atheist like myself, although the diff the I wouldn't say a difference between me and her, but a difference between many of the atheists, not myself. I'm coming more and more to understand that Ayn Rand's point of view uh, rings a chord with me. But there are a lot of people out there who assume that all secular humanists, atheists, you'll hear this kind of bashing, that these people are out for one world government, they're out to promote communism and such. While there is that faction, there is that type of atheist, there's also um, the atheist, what you would call right wing or the conservative, such as Ayn Rand. Um, in speaking of God and her atheism, her parents, this is from, by the way, this is from Who is Ayn Rand uh, by Nathaniel Brandon, who was one of the people who worked very closely with her for many years. Her parents, who were Jewish, were not particularly religious and had given her no formal religious training. The question of the existence of God had not interested her before, but now, attempting to formulate her convictions on a number of fundamental issues, she considered the question scrupulously and concluded that there was no God. She wrote the causes for her conclusion in her diary. First, that there are no reasons to believe in God. There is no proof of the belief. And second, that the concept of God is insulting and degrading to man. It implies that the highest possible is not to be reached by man, that he is an inferior being who can only worship an ideal he will never achieve. By her view, there could be no breach between conceiving of the best possible and deciding to attain it. She rejected the concept of God as morally evil, which is... Very strong stance to take. Um, did you have something else from... Uh, yeah, well, another thing that 
she said was uh, morally evil was the concept of original sin, which of course you would connect with with the concept of God. And I wanted to read some some of that. Let's see. This is from Galt's speech in uh, Atlas Shrugged, and it's also reprinted in her book for the New Intellectual. A sin without volition is a slap at morality and an insolent contradiction in terms. That which is outside the possibility of choice is outside the province of morality. If man is evil by birth, he has no will, no power to change it. If he has no will, he can neither be good nor evil. A robot is amoral. To hold as man's sin a fact open to his choice is a mockery. A fact not open to his choice is a mockery of morality. To hold man's nature as a sin is a mockery of nature. To punish him for a crime he committed before he was born is a mockery of justice. To hold him guilty in a, ma in a matter which, where no innocence exists is a mockery of reason. To destroy morality, nature, justice, and reason by means of a single concept is a feat of evil hardly to be matched. Yet that is the root of your code. Do not hide behind the cowardly evasion that man is born with free will but with a tendency to evil. A free will saddled with a tendency is like a game loaded with dice. It forces man to struggle through the effort of playing to bear responsibility and pay for the game, but the decision is weighted in favor of a tendency that he had no power to escape. If the tendency is of his choice, he cannot possess it at birth. If it is not of his choice, he, his will is not free. What is the nature of the guilt of your teachers that your teachers called original sin? What are the evils that man acquired when he fell from the state they consider perfection? Their myth declares that he ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge. He acquired a mind and became a rational being. It was the knowledge of good and evil. He became a moral being. He was sentenced to earn his bread by his labor. He became a productive being. He was sentenced to experience desire. He acquired the capacity for sexual enjoyment. The evils for which they damn him are reason, morality, creativeness, joy. All the cardinal values of his existence, it is not his vices that their myth of man's fall is designed to explain and condemn. It is not his errors that they hold as his guilt, but the essence of his nature as man. Whatever he was, that robot in the Garden of Eden, who existed without mind, without values, without labor, without love, he was not man. That's very good. She flies uh, directly in the face of, uh, of the Christian religion, totally opposite to every value held by the Christian religion uh, in reality. Um, when she talks about uh, such things as atheism, that it's important to remember that her whole philosophy is integrated. It all rests upon the other. If there's a reason for capitalism, there's also a reason for, for the atheism. It's not something that's decided just upon whim. It's built upon a long chain of, of reasoning uh, that is not easy to understand. It requires an effort, requires an intellectual effort, it requires that a person be willing to, to invest the time to really find out what is real, you know, what is what is actuality? What is reality? Uh, I'm going to read a little something here where she talks about the battle between capitalism and socialism as the battle between good and evil. She says, it is a battle for those who know why it is necessary to be out, as far out of that stream as words will carry. She's talking about the stream of socialism. Why, when moral issues are at stake, one must begin by blasting the enemy's base and cutting off any link to it, any bridge, any toehold, and if one is to be understood, misunderstood, let it be on the side of intransi intransience, not on the side of any resemblance to any part of so monstrous, monstrous and evil. It is a battle only for those who, paraphrasing a character in Atlas Shrugged, are prepared to say, capitalism was the only system in history where wealth was not acquired by looting, but by production, not by force, but by trade. The only system that stood for man's right to his own mind, to his work, to his life, to his happiness, to himself. If this is evil by the present standards of the world, if this is the reason for damning us, then we, we the champions of man, accept it and choose to be damned by the world. We choose to wear the name capitalism printed on our foreheads proudly as our badge of nobility. 
this is what the battle demands. Nothing less will do. Um, you probably haven't heard an awful lot about Ayn Rand, although she's influenced a lot of the thinkers and uh, political people nowadays. Gerald Ford, uh, uh, I understand, was, uh, was very interested in Ayn Rand's ideas. Margaret Thatcher, I understand, is, is very, uh, very supportive of, of Ayn Rand, as she is of capitalism. And Alan Greenspan, who is now the, uh, was he the top executive at the uh, Federal, Federal Reserve. Reserve Board, the head of the Federal Reserve, Reserve Board, he is, is very much into Ayn Rand. And the, the modern libertarian movement uh, owes a lot of its thinking uh, to what it has gotten from Ayn Rand, although I don't know that Ayn Rand or the objectivists would consider themselves libertarians. I understand there's, there's a big difference of opinion with them and the libertarians. Uh, yeah. However, Ayn Rand is for, uh, has some of the same, they have some of the same values, which would be privatization, uh, keeping the government out of our hair as much as possible, including uh, the economy. See, they, they took her politics, but they don't necessarily... Accept her philosophy, accept, right? You know, they, ne they don't necessarily base their politics on uh, her metaphysics and reason. Her ethics. Right, and her... Yeah. Yeah, it's a. She she really is a radical for capitalism. The more you read, the more you'll see that uh, she makes the case very well that uh, without allowing people to be free to choose where they spend their money, how they make their money, uh, allowing the free market to dictate uh, survival of the fittest, in essence. I wanted to no, it's not, mention it's something. Not survival of the fittest. Well, it is in a way because the fittest, intellectually speaking. Uh, but that, a free market, a laissez-faire would allow the fittest or the best to rise to the top, the cream to rise to the top. It will allow the best of men uh, to succeed, whereas right. a, another system such as socialism chops everyone off at the knees to make them equal. Uh, it says, well, you, you have more capability, but we'll put more of a handicap on you. You know, it's much like playing golf, you know. So, I wanted to mention a little short piece here concerning money and her idea towards money. Let me give you a tip on a clue to men's characters. The man who damns money has obtained it dishonorably. The man who respected it has earned it. Run for your life from any man who tells you that money is evil. That sentence is the leper's bell of an approaching looter. So long as men live together on earth and need means to deal with one another, their only substitute if they abandon money is the muzzle of a gun. Right there she says, if you do not have free trade, you must resort to barbarism. That's the only alternative. Right. Did you have another selection? Uh, uh, well, first I wanted to get back to that. The uh, difference on the <laughs> Clarify. Yeah. Uh, that, that saying that uh, survival of the fittest, that implies that the fit will survive while consuming the, the weak or at the expense of the weak. Well, well that's not true. It's, she didn't, she didn't uh, say that she was for... Uh, living off the weak or enslaving them or anything yeah, like I that. I didn't mean it in that way. What I meant was, uh, was that uh, would allow those to, who had the ability to succeed, of the freedom to do that, to do so, to succeed. Uh, whereas other systems of government demand that you don't. She pointed out in one of her essays, that I believe it was to West Point, she gave a, a, a graduation speech to West Point graduates, I think it was in 61 or 62, where she told about how uh, all you have to do is look and see the thousands, millions of people who are willing to risk their life to get out, you know, running from a socialist uh, system to see the failure of the system. She said that at one point, uh, I'm paraphrasing her, but 70 years ago or so when, at the Bolshevik Re Revolution, it could be understood how some intellectuals could be somehow, you know, have made the mistake of thinking that this could be a good thing. But now, in light of the fact that it's been tried all over the world and has nowhere succeeded, and of course, we see nowadays just the recent events. You know, the the crumbling of the Berlin Wall. Uh, I think there's a. They may not uh, be. I'm not saying by that that they're running to Ayn Rand's form of capitalism, but what they're doing is they're rejecting that which they have now. They know what they've got is not right. They may not know what to replace it with, but right now, uh, all over the world, we're seeing people who are saying, "Hey, uh, we want to be free." And now, how that freedom is going to be defined is a is the next step we have to concern ourselves with. Yeah, they may just be turning to what they think is freedom or, or democracy because 
uh, on a on a pragmatic basis. Basis, uh, they don't really know uh, where capitalism or or the democracy idea came from. They just know that what they had wasn't working. Mm -hmm. uh, did you want to read another? We got about five minutes left. If you want to go ahead and pick something that would kind of be a good a good summation, and then we'll. Uh, Put some addresses up on the screen to uh, where people can write for more information. Well, here's something uh, from a chapter called "Don't Let Don't Let It Go," in philosophy, who needs it? Can this country achieve a peaceful rebirth in the foreseeable future? By all presidents, it is not likely, but America is an unprecedented phenomenon. In the past, American perseverance became on occasion too long bearing a patience. But when Americans turned, they turned. What may happen to the welfare state is what happened to the Prohibition Amendment. Is there enough of the American sense of life left in people under the constant pressure of the cultural political efforts to obliterate it? It is impossible to tell. But those of us who hold it must fight for it. We have no alternative. We cannot surrender this country to a zero to men whose battle cry is mindlessness. We cannot fight against collectivism unless we fight against this moral base, altruism. We cannot fight against altruism unless we fight against its, epistemolog its epistemological base, irrationalism. We cannot fight against anything unless we fight for something. And what we must fight for is the supremacy of reason and a view of man as a rational being. These are philosophical issues the philosophy we need is a conceptual equivalent of America's sense of life. To propagate it would require the hardest intellectual battle, but isn't that a magnificent battle, to, a magnificent goal to fight for? Um, I guess uh, let's go ahead and suggest for someone beginning, just beginning, uh, has no idea who Ayn Rand is, saw the show, and want to pick up one book to start with. What would you think would probably be the best? I know I have one that I would suggest, but... I'll let you go ahead and make a suggestion. Uh, well, if they want it in the form of uh, fiction, I would say uh, maybe Atlas Shrugged or maybe The Fountainhead. Either one. But if they want it in a... Straight philosophy? Yeah, yeah if they want it in straight philosophy, probably philosophy who needs it. Yeah, I, I, that was what I was going to say. I was going to say uh, philosophy uh, who needs it is uh, probably the best... Uh, the best book overall has a series of, of articles, short articles concerning separate, you know, subjects. Uh, not all of them by Ayn Rand. Uh, Leonard Peikoff and I think Nathaniel Brandon also have, uh, and maybe even uh, Alan Greenspan I know was a contributor also to the Objectivist. The uh, another good one uh, is the Ayn Rand lexicon, which is a A to Z uh, quotes series of quotes, which should give you some food for thought and uh, lead you in the direction you might want to might want to go. Well, that's about all the time we have today. I'm going to, uh, after the quote, we'll have a couple of addresses up on the screen where you can write for more information. And uh, failing that, if you can't get a hold of anyone through that, or if, or if you just want to, uh, you can contact us. Our address is always uh, 999 East Bassey Road, Suite 180, San Antonio, Texas, 78209. And we'll see you next week on Free Thought Forum. I think as I please, and this gives me pleasure. My conscience decrees, this right I must treasure. My thoughts will not cater to duke or dictator. No person can deny, Deacon Duncan Sin Fry. No person can deny, Deacon Duncan Sin Fry. me 
and throw me in prison. My thoughts will burst free like...